Last Monday night, I had the privilege to pray over the hot stove dinner. Now, the hot stove dinner is a whole bunch of uh, people that like baseball, have been kind of hooked into baseball, and it's lots of kids. And uh, I was at a basketball game a couple of three weeks ago when some guy came and said, you know, we're doing this hot stove dinner, and and they only plan it all year long, but he, he said, we, uh, we'd like for you to come and pray over it. So being an old baseball fan, I said, good, I'll go and pray over it. And then I found out later that one of the characters of the game was going to be there, a guy by the name of Billy Martin. And uh, sure enough, uh, Billy showed up. And when I knew that Billy was supposed to be there, I thought about a thing that happened when Billy was managing the Oakland A's. He's now the renamed manager of the New York Yankees. But for a number of years, he was the manager of the Oakland A's. And while he was there, I went to a game one time and they gave out a, a mug shot of Billy Martin. And, and his baseball cap, he had a little gold cross right in there. And I had that thing framed and hung it in my office. And all the time he was managing the A's, a part of my commitment to the Lord on behalf of Billy Martin was to pray for him every day that I came into my office. That picture was there to remind me. And a lot of people would say, why do you have that on the wall? Well, so I can pray for him. Oh, okay. You know, that's entirely too spiritual a thing to do, you know. And, and so uh, I, it was a good reminder. And then he uh, went other places and managed and his picture came down and went kind of behind the, the bookshelf. But I always said, to myself and to the Lord, if I ever get a chance to be with Billy Martin personally, I'm going to tell him about his picture hanging in my office and about those years that I prayed for him every day I came into my office. Just as a reminder, there are folks out there that care about him. And so when the time came for me to pray, I somehow when they plan these things protocol says the prayer sits way at the end of the head table you never sit near the microphone you always make that long walk speaker sits close to the microphone so you never get to sit close to the speaker but I came over I prayed and then they were into dinner and so I stopped by and introduced myself to Billy and I said I want you to know something and I told him the story about his picture hanging in my office and about me praying for him every day during those years he was managing the A's and he said this thank you I'm I'm grateful for that because God is the source of my strength now if you know anything about Billy Martin he is a wild-eyed beggar <laughs> I mean, his escapades would fill a very large book. I read his book entitled Billy Ball, read it years ago when it came out. But he is some kind of a guy. Lifestyle has been wild for him. I mean, married, divorced, married, divorced, about to get married again to somebody young enough to be his daughter. And uh, maybe that's the excitement in life, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, I mean, drunken brawls, fist fights, all kinds of problems and yet this is his first response God is the source of my strength and I went back to my place and I, I sat down and I'm, I'm turning this stuff over in my mind I'm really not planning it to use it here on Sunday morning but I, I'm turning it over in my mind and then I I had uh, seen Walt Franklin one of our deacons and his two kids were there at the game Walt is an absolute baseball freak and he's going to force this on his children. And uh, uh, so the kids were there. Actually, it was one of them that was up here. Uh, whether they wanted to be or not, they had to go because that made it okay for Walt to go, you know. And uh, so I, I, he had said to me earlier, can you, uh, could you take this ball and have Billy autograph? I had a brand new baseball. And I said, Walt, I don't, I don't know about that at all. I don't know how he reacts in the crowd. And, and so as I went back and sat down, I thought, I think I can get that done. So while everybody's eating dinner, I went down to Walt and said, give me that baseball, and he did, and I went back up, and I said, Billy, one of the guys from my church is here with his kids, would you, sure, autograph that thing. And I handed him a business card, and I said, Billy, send me a new picture, one in pinstripes, as the Yankee manager. And he wrote a note on that card that said, send picture. 
Now, I, I think he'll do that. I think I'll get a picture to hang on my wall to pray for him while he's with the Yankees. May not be long. It hasn't been before, you know. <laughs> if you don't know, this is fifth time managing the Yankees. This goes round and round on that one. But a part of what I plan to do when that picture shows up, I plan to write him a note on the front page of Swindoll's newest book, The Quest for Character, to encourage him to develop a godly character. And I'll tell you what triggered this. When he spoke that night, it was beautiful. He started by speaking to the little league coaches and to the parents and the grandparents who were there. And he said to them, let the kids be kids for as long as they can be. Don't pressure them. Their peers will pressure them into becoming competitors. You let them be children for as long as they can be. That's a wonderful word to come out of his mouth. And I'll tell you, everything Billy said could have been said right from this pulpit on a Sunday morning. It was neat. And I walked out of there and I thought, how is it that a guy can live with so much responsibility to kids, but obviously not understand he has great responsibility to his peers? I think there are a lot of us that live that way. If we're around kids, we watch our language, we watch our action, we watch a lot of things. But if we're around our peers, we kind of live with the notion, let her rip, I can do what I please, it's their problem, they're adults, they can figure out what they ought to do, instead of understanding that the world is looking for leadership. Your little world is looking for leadership. And without that understanding, we live without a sense of responsibility to our peers. That isn't just a Billy Martin specialty. That's pretty widespread, and it's widespread inside the church. I listened to a tape recently of a, of a pastor who was preaching a sermon on things I wish Jesus hadn't said. It was a great sermon. Things I wish Jesus hadn't said, like do unto others as you would that they should do unto you. Wish he hadn't said that. I'd like to be just as mean as the next guy. I wish he hadn't said things like lay up treasure in heaven instead of putting it away here on earth where it can be stolen or can devalue overnight, October 19 or whatever it was. Uh, Jesus didn't put the date in, but you know, he understood where it can lose value in a short period of time here. He said, send it on ahead, give money. Wish he hadn't said, a lot of folks wish he hadn't said that. A lot of things that Jesus said that we wish he hadn't have said. There are a lot of things in the scripture that we wish weren't there because they deal with this area of responsibility to our peers. And I wanna just lay a few of them out for you and let you go. Romans chapter 12, your assignment for this week is every day read Romans 12 and 13. Chapters 12 and 13 of Romans, read them both every day. I'm going to tell you what, if you take time and some of you say, oh, two chapters, <laughs> oh my. It will be 1 25th of the time you spend reading the newspaper if you read these two chapters. For most of you in this congregation. Doesn't take that long. Romans 12 and 13. Go to Romans 12. I asked Mitch to read those first two verses because they're the foundation we must stand on. First of all, as a responsibility to God and to ourselves, we are asked to give our bodies to God and let them be a living sacrifice, holy, the kind he can accept. When you think of what he's done for you, is this too much to ask? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. Then you will learn from your own experience how his ways will really satisfy you. See, I am persuaded that there are many, many, many believers that have never experienced the fact that the ways of God will really satisfy you. 
God deals with you about an issue and you push it aside and say, don't bug me with that. It just won't work. Here's Ted, a guy that had a very successful business career. And as God began to deal with him about giving his life to the work of Awana and being that missionary that travels and runs hither and yon to make sure the work continues to get done and to build the work, the response was, Lord, I'll go. And the great satisfaction of his life is so much greater than anything he ever had in a successful business career. This is not a dropout of business. This is not one who went through the strains of saying, I absolutely failed in every department. This is a man who was successful. But he also knew how to listen to the call of God and give his body to the Lord. Now, you don't have to go into full-time Christian service, but if we could get Christians to be full-time Christians by starting with this is the foundation, I'm going to give my body to God. That includes my mind. Some of your lives are messed up because you have never gotten your mind in the proper gear to listen to the Word of God and apply it on a daily basis. And you find yourselves constantly copying the behavior and the customs of this world. Philip's translation of this is a great one. It says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. It's exactly what the world does. Pressure's on out there every day for every one of us. To be a strong Christian man open about your faith and yet excited about the opportunities that God gives you. One of our guys is going to Washington, D.C. in a few days. John Conricus is sitting back here. Hispanic businessman who has done well. Served us well in Vietnam and came back not to spend the rest of his life talking about Vietnam, but got into business and worked along. And in the last three years has come into a strong commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes to the White House to a very special event to be a part of helping acknowledge the great work that Hispanics are doing across this country and help others to do the same. I'm proud of you, John. I'm proud of the opportunity God has opened up for you, but I see that it comes out of a tremendous heart for God. This man never talks to me without talking to me about how grateful he is for what God has done in his life. I anticipate that a trip to Washington, D.C. is only going to give him more opportunity to talk about his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sure, there'll be talk about business, but there will be also talk about the real thrust of his life, the Lord Jesus Christ and the place that he occupies in John's life. People, there are opportunities all around us, and unless we stand on this foundation of saying, I am going to give God my body, I'm going to give God my mind, I am not going to allow the world to squeeze me into its mold. I want to learn from my own experience how the ways of God will really satisfy me and let him pour out his blessing upon you. That's what he wants to do. There are four, four things that he outlines in these two chapters, and I just want to hit them because you're going to read them every day, aren't you? You're going to read 12 and 13 every day, and you're going to go over this in your mind. Look what he says in, in verses 3 through 8. He talks about using your gifts. Some of you kind of have the notion that when God gave out gifts, you were behind the door and you missed out. When the door opened, it opened, and there you're squeezed up against the wall, and he gave gifts to everybody, but you were where you couldn't reach around the door and didn't give you any. That's not true. The scripture says, we must work together. He says, God has given each of us the ability to do certain things well. You hear that? He has given each of us, not a few of us, or some of us, or most of us, but as believers, he has given each of us the ability to do certain things well. So if God has given you one of these abilities, then use it. Like, if your job is that of serving others, serve them well. Hmm. Interesting, he puts that way up there at the top. Your job is serving others. We like to be where we get service, don't we? Huh? Snap. I was visiting Robin in the, in the hospital yesterday. And uh, she buzzed the nurse and said, would you please come and get the baby? 
You know, pity pat, pity pat. Here came the nurse, scooped up the baby. And she said, boy, that's really neat, Dad. I'll be home in a day or so, and there won't be anybody to buzz and say, would you come and get the baby? But we like to have service. All of us like to have service. A lot of times we don't like to do service. All of us are called to do service, but there are some that are specially good at serving others. Serve them well. If you're a teacher, do a good job of teaching. I am so blessed with the awareness that around this place we have good, qualified, godly teachers from the little kids all the way up. Our teachers are teaching the Word of God and they're doing it well. They get trained. They get instructed. It's always interesting to me to watch Michelle work. Because Michelle will call some big shot businessman in the church to teach a class and then she'll make an appointment with him and go and sit in his office and say, now here's what I want you to teach. Not just the material, here's what I want you to teach in that material. Spells it out. Doesn't just say, well, I know he'll do good. She's going to make sure he does good by spelling it out to him. That's responsible attitude toward the total ministry that God has given us to do here together. If you're a preacher, see to it that your sermons are strong and helpful. I've been listening to some of my sermons in the last week, especially. I've been kind of catching up. I've really been laying it on you lately. And in fact, this morning, I really wanted to just come down here and love you for a little while. You know, just one of those neat sermons that you walk away kind of with the warm fuzzies and saying, boy, he's really all right, isn't he? And I, I couldn't get any direction. I could not get an okay from the Lord to come and do that today. Now, one of these days he's going to let me do that. But it isn't today. I've been listening to some other guy's sermons in the last two weeks. And they're so busy quoting this guy and that guy and the other guy, making sure they give everybody credit. I think old Senator Biden scared the wits out of him, afraid they're going to steal a little something. I do enough study that if I'm going to take time to tell you where I get everything, I'm not going to have any time left to preach. Mainly, I want to open this book and spell out to you what's in this book and have you go away reading it and understanding what your responsibilities are. And I come to the end of listening to some other guy's sermons and I think, and not all of them, and I'm not the, uh, I'm not the greatest thing that ever lived, but I just want to know something. I live with the responsibility that these are to be strong and helpful sermons. And I listen to some guys preach and I get through and I think, what am I supposed to do with that? Big deal. I heard about a lot of thinkers and a lot of writers and a lot of other people, but I didn't hear much of the word of God. I believe there's a way to preach that is strong and is helpful if we stay with the Word of God because there's another teacher that has been called alongside to bring fruit from that which is preached. He goes on to say this, if God has given you money, be generous in helping others with it. Now most of you say, boy, it's good, that missed me because I'm, I'm not much of a giver because I don't have much money. See, we all ought to be a giver. We all ought to learn how to tithe. That's a sore subject with a lot of believers because they don't want to get in that, in that bucket of learning how to tithe. They don't want to get there. They've never gotten there yet. And in fact, you may have gotten your report from the church this week of what you gave in 1987. And you may have not wanted to open it because you knew it was pathetic. And then you got up the courage and you did open it and sure enough, it was pathetic. <laughs> and some of you... Some of you should have crawled off in a corner somewhere and gotten on your knees and said, God, forgive me for being so selfish. Some of you could have gone and said, thanks, Lord, for the privilege. You see, this says if you have money, if you're making big money and you're still just giving God 10%, you are really mixed up. If you were giving him 10% when you were making 20000 a year and now you're making 100000 a year and you're still giving him 10%, you have really missed the message. 
God has given you an ability to make money. Learn how to give generously back to him. I am not on a commission basis, folks. I don't say that for my sake. I say it for your sake. To learn how to be generous with the Lord. If God has given you administrative ability and put you in charge of the work of others, take the responsibility seriously. It's interesting to be here in this message today and have Ted be here with our Awana people. Galen Van Allsburg is one of our men in the church. He's kind of a quiet guy. He, he doesn't stand out a whole lot to a lot of you folks. Galen is commander-in-chief of the Awana program in this church. He has a very fine position at which he works to make his money. A good job. Highly responsible in that job. He has two sons that he and Mary, unable to have children of their own, two sons that they have adopted, and he is one of the most responsible fathers I know. He takes time with those guys. Loves them dearly. Mary was sick the other day, and, 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 and Galen just called in and said, uh, i got to be home with my boys. And somebody said to him, how do you tell them that? You're, you're not the boss. You don't own that place. He said, I need to be home with my boys. They don't understand that. They don't understand lesson number one. They'll have to find themselves somebody else. Not arrogant, just responsible. And that man with a responsible job with a family of his own takes time to be the commander-in-chief of this Awana program that is an excellent program teaching the Word of God to children. I am so blessed that a man with his skills steps up and says, yes, I'll do the job. There are a bunch of you out there that are hiding. Hope he never finds out I can do anything. See, a lot of folks can do all kinds of things until it comes to the things of God. And at that point, they hide. And all you're doing is losing out because one day you're going to be in a place where you can't hide. You're going to be standing before God Almighty, give an account for what you did with the gift of life. And there'll be no hiding there. That's not to frighten you. That's just to give you the word so you understand. You can't stand there and say, nobody ever told me. And he says, those who offer comfort to the sorrowing should do so with Christian cheer. One of the reasons I asked Mitch to pray for the Riska family this morning, they're out of Campus Baptist Church. Helga Riska was a very good friend of our daughter Robin. Helga's with the Lord today, 35 years old in a very tragic and goofy accident this week. Somebody got in a van equipped with tools for driving it with handles, a handicapped person's van, and somebody that wasn't handicapped got in there to drive it for him. And something went wrong and shot across Shaw Avenue and right into Helga and killed her. And less than a year ago, their daughter who had cystic fibrosis and had made that last wish to go to Disneyland. And they had her in a van and they were on their way to Disneyland and she died in Bakersfield on the way. And there's Tom today with two boys to raise. Robin told me, she said, Dad, I spent a tremendous amount of time with Helga during the Christmas season because she was in so much pain over the loss of their daughter. Today, Helga's all right. She is at home with her daughter, but there's Tom and those boys. They need the prayers of God's people, and that's why we offer prayer on their behalf. See, we've all got gifts that can be used in some degree or another, if we will. He says three other things. In our personal relationships, the rest of chapter 12, oh, I want you to read that. In our political relationships, chapter 13, 1 through 7, he talks about what we need to be doing, voting, obeying the government, being what we ought to be. And then beginning at verse 8, he talks about our public relationships, and he says, pay all the debts except the debt of love for others. Never finish paying that. 
It's a great community. Many of you have taken much out of this community, but you haven't invested a great deal back in it. As believers, we have a responsibility to invest something back in this community that has given us so much. And finally, he gives the why for all of this. Beginning at 11. Another reason for right living is this. You know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up for the coming of the Lord is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day of his return will soon be here. So quit the evil deeds of darkness and put on the armor of right living. As we who live in the daylight should. Be decent and true in everything you do so that all can approve your behavior. Spending your time in wild parties and getting drunk or in adultery and lust or in fighting or in jealousy is wrong. But ask the Lord Jesus Christ to help you live as you should. And don't make plans to enjoy evil. Oh, I encourage you today. The major reason for right living is the soon return of Jesus Christ. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. That's that song that Connie's playing right now. Is that the kind of life you live? I challenge you to spend time in Romans 12 and 13 this week and be honest with God. And let the Spirit of God accomplish what he wants to accomplish in your life. If you're not saved, pull that card out and fill it out and put it in a mailbox around the door here and let us sit with you this week and open the word of God and help you come to the Savior. Thanks for being here. Stand with me. Let's pray and go home. Father, it's so good to be here. So good to open the word, and even though there are times we open it and we kind of flinch because we know we haven't been where we ought to be, I pray that we would commit ourselves to right living. And I pray that the assignment to read Romans 12 and 13 would be easily accepted and carried out daily. I ask you for hundreds of people to be involved in that reading because I know what the Spirit of God will do if we'll but give him the tools. And so bless us as we go. Bless that one that says, I need to know Jesus. I, I don't know how. It's scary to put my name on a card and stick it in a box and I don't know what kind of person will call on me. Lord, I pray they would trust us and trust you enough to fill it out and put it in the box and give us an opportunity to show them how they can know the Savior and know that satisfying life that he gives. So bless us as we go. We thank you in the name of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. Good to be with you.